This is a conversation with Matt Robinson, who is a program manager for Ross Industrial Americas at the Southwest Research Institute. Ross Industrial is a group that seeks to help industrial users, for example factories, leverage Ross and its ecosystem. Ross Industrial has many parts, including a GitHub organization for code contributions, regional consortiums, and a newly announced working group. In this interview, Matt and I talk about how industry often solves problems and how those solutions can be improved with more modern tooling like Ross and Git, Matt's background, Ross Industrial's consortium, and Ross Industrial's new working group. This is the Sensing Act podcast. I'm Audro Nash. Thank you to our founding sponsor, Open Robotics, and here is my conversation with Matt Robinson. Hi, Matt. Would you introduce yourself? <laughs> yes, absolutely. I'm Matt Robinson. Um, I'm the Ross Industrial Americas Consortium Program Manager based here at Southwest Research Institute. Um, yep, that's me. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Uh, would you give me a bit of background on Ross Industrial? Yeah, so <clears throat> I'm just bringing up my notes. Uh, so Ross Industrial um, is an open source project that seeks to extend Ross robot operating system uh, to industrial uses and applications in industrial relevant hardware, right? So it was, in, it was uh, kind of conceived around 2011. Mm -hmm. um, and then around 2013, a, a consortium was established to kind of help give guidance to what we should be working on next. Hmm. And can you define industrial for me? Like, what does it mean to, like, where, what are we targeting exactly with industrial? In this yeah no that's a great question right and we get that a lot right so there's a lot of sometimes assumptions uh, when you tag something as industrial in the context of um, of the Ross industrial open source project um, we are seeking to you know provide open source utilities that enable industrial applications on industrial relevant hardware so that's the mean the main component um, uh, of the industrial tag if you will Mm -hmm. Right, so there's a lot of specific hardware that shows up in the automation space in factories, and sometimes it's somewhat. Um, <laughs> it can have like it be long in the tube, right? I mean, like it's very common for certain industrial industrial sectors to put hardware that they expect it to be there for 10, 15 years, um, and so there are very proven pipelines to facilitate these automated processes that are somewhat unique, right? So we want to provide interfaces. Uh, means to interact and take advantage of of this robust ecosystem, um, mm -hmm. and so that's where the extending uh, Ross into this industrial space uh, was kind of the main component. Now that said, uh, as part of like kind of like our overriding themes and, and mission, it, it is to think about the in, when people hear industrial, what are they sort of these things they think of? Right, they think of reliability, durability, uh, quality, right, uptime, mm -hmm. things of that nature. Right, so what are things we have to do as we think about the capabilities that we seek to deliver and tools we seek to provide? How do we how do we realize those those sort of attributes? Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Very interesting. So going back a little bit, um, industrial relevant hardware, how, and you mentioned that it should be around for a long time, so um, people can plan to use it. How do you select your industrial relevant hardware? Right, that's that's a good question too, right? So let's just let's talk about a couple of the examples of what industrial hard, mm -hmm. relevant hardware may be, right? Because that's kind of can be somewhat ambiguous. Um, <clears throat> so the industrial manipulator, right? So we think about mm -hmm. if you've seen like the the big snapshot of like a place where they make cars and they have all the the arms reaching in, and, and there's sometimes sparks flying if it's a video. Um, that's sort of the industrial manipulator we're targeting. Um, now, okay. obviously, like behind me, we have a number of these other types of manipulators as well that are sort of um, set up to be, and depending on the application, can work around people. Um, mm -hmm. But that is also a class of industrial relevant hardware in the context of a manipulator. But we also look at things like uh, PLCs, the Programmable Logic right. Controller, mm -hmm. you know, provided by companies like Rockwell and Bradley, and of course Siemens. Um, and, uh, and of course, looking at like different like sort of vision tools, uh, both emerging contemporary 3D cameras, 
uh, mm -hmm. all the way back to your traditional 2D cameras, which have been running in factory lines, you know, for like the last 30 years. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's sort of the, those are just some examples of industrial relevant hardware that, that we seek to help people be able to bring and merge with the capabilities that are kind of coming forward in, in the Ross ecosystem. And what was kind of the, the problem or something that made it so um, you or whoever started Ross Industrial, um, like why did it, why, why did you begin it? What problem kind of led to you wanting to create this organization? Right. So, you know, mind you, like, and we can talk a bit about like the whole layers of Ross Industrial. Mm -hmm. um, the Ross Industrial Open Source project was, was started uh, is inspired by actually a little bit similar to my background as well. The group here uh, at Southwest Research Institute um, mm -hmm. also delivers solutions. Now, it's not like an, a solution provider integrator in the traditional sense, uh, being a not-for-profit institute here um, at Southwest Research Institute. But the group mm -hmm. here uh, develops like sort of like unique, um, high-mix, one-of-a-kind, oftentimes prototype solutions that that live and and operate in factory environments or field environments and have been doing so since the early 80s hmm. up until before before they adopted ROS, uh, very often they would develop that advanced application with the industrial tools that were available at the time right so um be it a, a, a industrial manipulator in the control platform that comes with a kuka robot or fanic or avb mm -hmm. They would develop those solutions and get something working that does something new and novel. But lo and behold, if they had to do something similar, but some unspecified a different mix, if you will, of the industrial hardware, um, they had to basically rewrite the software from scratch, mm -hmm. right? Because in the industrial ecosystem, um, the, the whole stack from the hardware all the way back through how you develop applications for that hardware operates in a proprietary um, chain, if you will. I won't call it a software stack but exactly, um, mm -hmm. but but all those communication, the middleware, if you will, as well as like the programming language and environments, they are all proprietary uh, to that hardware set you're selecting. Uh, and then even certain vendors like would kind of team up and have better bridges or complementing oh. tools from other companies. And so, so it, yeah, it, it wasn't was very like, swappable. For, for all these different, so you'd make a, a solution and it would be like a mobile base and then there'd be a robot arm on it. And the mobile base and the robot arm would both have kind of like their own ways of talking. So it, it was like a domain specific language often for using either of those. And then you would have to have software that is kind of translating between them so that you can make them talk and do some sort of application. Is that correct? Or you would have to write in that specific domain language. Or write in that that's, specific domain language. Correct. And that's usually what happened. And that's ah. where I came from as well. I got very adept at, at a, uh, scripting in you know, vendor-specific program languages. And that's where a lot of us who were doing you know, traditional industrial robot deployments uh, dating back to the early 90s, that's kind of how we came up. Mm -hmm. right? And so you know, the challenge is, it's like, hey, this industrial robotic solution may offer some advantages, but it brings with it different software, different scripting languages, uh, how, how you implement applications, how you set up communications. You mm -hmm. have to actually factor that if you were going to actually look at other, other, other solutions. And so obviously the advent of this group here, and Sean Edwards, who's in the picture behind me, when they went out to Willow Garage uh, and had that first Yaskawa Motorman robot sent there in around 2011, and created that first interoperability between Ross and Industrial Group, there was an aha moment. So, mm. hey, I can develop my advanced application in a sort of a hardware agnostic fashion and not have to reinvent all this stuff because I have to do some other application with a different hardware set later. And that in the industrial robotics space, that was that was like a, a, a real a, a huge win. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so it was because you don't have to reuse a real opportunity. Okay, gotcha. Okay, so speak, can you speak a bit more? It, so it was a big opportunity because you could make it so that um, instead of using these domain-specific languages for each hardware component, you could instead maybe abstract out that component and then connect to it with ROS or some other like high-level thing that um, you can use as middleware for this. Correct. Okay. 
And then um, that gives you the ability to just worry about you. So you write your interface for this, um, whatever the device is, then you use it in a stack and then you can swap it out with other components. You can swap yes. new things in. As long as they have interfaces, you have one way of talking to them and controlling them. Correct? Yes, that, that is obviously the, the goal. Obviously yep. the devil's in the details, always. But but yes, exactly, right? And, and that was definitely new in, in industrial circles, right? You either became very good at working with like, you know, a KUKA or a Yaskawa or a FANIC. Because mm, they have their could, own language in a sense. And a lot of tools, literally. right? Yep. And, and different support. Um, and, they, and they encourage people. Like when I came from industry, um, I mean, obviously like Vendor X wanted us to buy all of their stuff, including yep. their software programming environments. And everything. They, had, they were incentivized to not foster interoperability, right, at the time. Mm -hmm. um, so fortunately, like, right, this, this notion of abstraction, which is obviously very common in the software world, um, was sort of was not. Uh, a new concept uh, to develop industrial applications. Mm -hmm. Now, going back a little bit, I would love to hear about your background and kind of how you got started with all of this. Right, right. So. <laughs> To catch up uh, for the listeners, right? I, I had to, you know, confess that I, I'm not a software developer, right? So uh, I, I came out of like sort of like a materials joining, materials research, welding, materials and metals uh, domain, uh, and caught on with Caterpillar, <clears throat> the uh, the heavy industry equipment producer and engine manufacturer. Uh, I worked in their corporate research group. And quickly got into developing uh, applications on robots, largely focusing in the early phases on specifically welding. Uh, and some of it pretty complex welding operations. We're trying to control different things to, to realize very specific outcomes. Hmm. <clears throat> and we had a lot of success in developing applications. Uh, you know, we had these this robot, right? And it was all set up and had all these extra bells and whistles. And we get something working really great. We're like, okay. Take that and go around the world and make it work. And then very quickly we learned. <laughs> what do you mean take that, that and go around the world and make it work? So like deploy well, it at scale or what do you mean? Well, it, it, it scales relative, right? Caterpillar yeah. is not a, you know, not a Ford or a GM, right? <clears throat> um, and, and so it'd be like, you know, they may make, you know, a given product like a wheel loader. They may make it in five or six places. Uh, mm -hmm. And the robots may be like maybe three or four per site. Right, because uh, you're only okay. you're not making as many wheel loaders as you are, like you know, four door sedans. Yep. So, so you know, not enough, not enough. Let's just say buying power to really put pressure on OEMs to play nice. Um, not enough okay. buying power to justify buying an exact same piece of equipment and shipping it around the world. Um, so, what would happen is it's like this site, weird spot of where you're not able to scale incredibly effectively because you don't have all the factories lined up for it. So it was fairly custom solutions, but it's also big enough that you want to deploy it 20 times or I don't know, some, yeah. some larger number of times where it has to be you, you, like all the, all the bugs will come out and it, it will be unreliable unless you kind of work it out well. Yeah. I, you know, if we scale back to just sort of a very manufacturing like sort mm -hmm. of benefit, in, in, and in particular, if we're dealing with something that has to do meaningful work in the field, mm -hmm. right? So like a wheel loader, right? It's got to lift heavy stuff. Um, there's a tangible benefit if I can use robots to make it because the consistent quality uh, actually leads to a better performing product that I can sell to people, right? It lifts more, it, it's, it weighs less, so it consumes less gas, Mm -hmm. um, or diesel in the case of <laughs> big equipment. Uh, and so there's a real incentive uh, as a, and a real marketing improved product I can go out there and sell if I can leverage automation to produce it. Now, the okay. challenge was because we weren't, we're not, you know, that particular group I was working with was not, you know, they can't buy thousands of robots, right? GM has a real benefit when they work with industrial robot providers because they buy so many, they can make mm -hmm. a lot of, you know, dictate some rules. They can so say, I want this custom thing that's going to be a bunch of additional work. And because of the scale of it, um, the right. people making the robots are like, okay, we'll do that. That sounds good to us. Yeah. And I found out, like, obviously, obviously, there was a lot of other folks, if you will, in the same boat that I was in, right? Where, hey, these different sites, they could justify buying automation. But when it came, but they couldn't necessarily buy exactly the same thing due to support 
Like they would buy different brands because that's what was available and how. It's oh, available. I could see why um, this was so, so painful because if you're, yeah, so, you have to buy different parts because different brands are available in different regions. Now you have to hook up to that domain specific thing and have it talk it really and, quick. Yeah, yep. we had our application running really well on a nice orange robot with this right sensor and had to replicate <laughs> it on a totally different mix of hardware. And it, we literally showed up. I showed up in, you know, this other location <laughs> and, and had to start from scratch. And, and wow. my, my, my one week trip turned into like a month and a half. So, wow. so um, that, that ended up being one of the real resonating business cases to when I was at Caterpillar to, to get involved with the Ross Industrial Open Source Project as well. Uh, mm -hmm. And it learned that aerospace companies, uh, other heavy equipment manufacturers, oil and gas companies, um, you know, I'm just ticking through a few, even, even tier one automotive, right? Because they have a slightly different problem than say your GM example. Where tier, tier one, one automotive, automotive, is that like the really big car companies or I, I don't know what tier that refers one, to? Tier one, whatever, whether it's automotive or, or even for Anything. dealers, is mm -hmm. anyone who provides the parts to the OEM. Or the person who oh, makes, okay. Uh, and OEM is original equipment manufacturing. Equipment manufacturing. Right. So GM okay, so it's for the people car, making. Yep. Right. GM, you know, they make the car. They're the OEM. And a company that's providing them, like, say, the seats or the dashboard assembly would be a tier one. <clears throat> oh, okay. Right. So the parts that so go into the, the final product, that's the tier yes. one. So it, it keeps going back. So tier two is the ones that provide the parts to tier one. Is it correct? Correct. Oh, that's okay. absolutely correct. The, the, now we're getting into supply chain, which is very resonant in the uh, pandemic era, right? Yeah. So, but, uh, but no, we were, <laughs> but, uh, sorry, one of my speakers went out, but, um, but yeah, so, so we, we ended up learning that a lot of other uh, producers, manufacturers, people interested in adopting the benefits of robotics ran into mm -hmm. a lot of these same challenges. And that was really insightful. And all of a sudden, we're starting to build this little industrial community. The, it's like the challenge was explicitly that um, most things were not able to talk well um, to each other because of domain-specific languages or like custom hardware setup. So it was like they were very reliable industrial devices, but they didn't play nice with other things. So developing kind of like custom automation solutions were it was an extremely difficult task because of this. The, the domain specific languages that they were yes. controlled in. And I would, I would say that was obviously the very prescient in your face upfront challenge, but obviously it also drove a, a lot of like limited ability for reuse, you know, mm. it drove, um, so a lot of like, you know, Hey, we'd fund some research in, in a university and we, we can maybe get it into a point solution, but we couldn't really leverage it properly. Yeah. Um, gotcha. So, you know, we ended up learning a lot of these other sort of, you know, when you go back and, and look at, you know, how a lot of software companies have evolved over the years, the, the presence of open source, how it's able to be leveraged. What do we talk about? What do we mean by pre-competitive IP? Like all this was sort of new in, in some of the industrial circles, at least that I ran in uh, before before I got involved uh, really mm -hmm. in the details with Ross Industrial. Uh, and, and learning that a lot of other manufacturers had these same challenges, uh, it was, it was gotcha. really a learning experience. Okay. And then, so you were at Caterpillar, where did you go from, so you, and then you were building these kind of custom solutions for doing some sort of automation task that would improve a fairly small man, like you were making only, um, I don't know the numbers, but you had like 20 robots making them or something, some product, right. the wheel loader or whatever you have mentioned. Um, yeah. Where'd you go from there? So, you know, like I said, I worked at corporate research and we had a little automation team. And so mm -hmm. we started basically collaborating with the team here at Southwest Research Institute to identify mm -hmm. some potential <clears throat> near-term use cases or business cases around, like, what, what does Ross really offer us? Right. Okay. So, so at, at this the, time, at the, you had been exposed to Ross or like, how did Ross come into the picture? We ran into... Uh, the Ross Industrial team at, at, a, at a conference. Oh, actually. okay. Uh, and asked them, we're like, hey, what is this? Tell us about it. Um, and my predecessor, Paul Voss, and Sean Edwards, again, pictured over my shoulder for those watching the video. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and their boss, Paul Evans, they came out to Caterpillar and, and explained it to us, right? And then we found a way to kind of get involved. And hence, there was already this consortium established. And, and as Caterpillar, we, we joined that consortium. Right. Mm -hmm. So I was kind of the caterpillar face for the Ross Industrial Consortium 
uh, mm-hmm. and I started like kind of collaborating and, and sharing <laughs> horror stories with other members. But, but, but then how can we move the ball forward, leveraging open source? And, and is, this, is this something we can really do in an industrial setting? That was still a question uh, mm-hmm. back in like 20, 2015, 2014. Wow. Uh, can, we la- can we actually solve, can we solve industrial problems with, with ROS? Open uh, source. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and what did, so, and then how did that investigating that question go? Right, right. So obviously we got involved. Uh, the consortium is a bunch of other similar minded folks with similar challenges. Um, you know, and, and it's not rel- it's not narrow to like say construction equipment or whatever. I rattled off a couple other industries, mm-hmm. um, the Bo- Boeing's and, and and others. There was a documentary for, out of BMW not long ago, um, <clears throat> and so you know we got involved with a couple different pilot initiatives to kind of see if we could prove like, hey, what can we do? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, to that point, everything we did was very you know, I grabbed up the user interface, this teach pendant on the robot, and I, you know, programmed it. I could script it in my computer and then load it yeah. onto the robot, but I was still really, I'd still have to go through and tweak all those positions, like, right? You From drive their the robot, interface for how it. to do it. Yeah. Right. So I've heard, so, I've heard some horror stories about that, but I, I don't know that I really, that, so that, that's yeah. crazy. You would like, it, it's like this. A big tablet, and you would like. Would it be like a block programming kind of thing on some interface that the company made, no, it's, or it's it's scripting? Yeah, it's, it's like scripting. a scripting language, gotcha. right? And and, and, and this if, would be like if I was control. a little bit more prepared, if I was a little more prepared, I would have brought, wheeled over one of these robots here. And we could, have, <laughs> could, have, could have done it live, but ah. um, but but no, it was very laborious. And they were introducing things like offline programming, but it was really just sitting at your desk doing it on a computer version ah. of the robot. <laughs> And you'd still have to go out. And, you'd still have to go out in the lab and, and or in the shop floor and, and then fix test it. it. Oh yeah, yeah. Because you couldn't see what well, it was doing. You could just write the bulk of it from your computer. Yeah, and you might have like a visualization, but then Some it never simulator. perfectly matches the physical system, right? So that's why when we talk about the utilities that for industrial use cases, one of the ones is all the stuff around calibration. Um, hmm. And so we ran some pilot programs during my time at Caterpillar, and was like, oh wow, like I could really not do this traditional industrial robot programming, but this teaching with the teach pendant or whatever at an offline <laughs> program in the desk. Um, yeah. you, you know, hey, we can basically do this notion of like, you know, use perception, perceive things, leverage the data streams to make decisions, do motion planning yep. and, and, and actually execute processes. That was mind blowing at the time, like in this 2013, 2014 timeframe. And so we ran a couple of pilot projects in, in parallel, like we'd already been doing work in perception, like, mm-hmm. Hey, wow, 3d cameras. This is, this is really useful. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and notions of segmentation, right? Like, Oh, work on this and not that. Um, yeah. and, 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 and so we'd been doing work with universities in that space, but again, it was really hard to scale. So bringing to generalize together, it. And yes. You said it was like a point solution. So it's solving one specific problem, but not, it doesn't generalize <laughs> to other problems very easily. Okay. Correct. So we started getting into like what they called at the time, um, this focused technical project, which are these collaborative projects in the Ross Industrial Consortium on blending. And blending is this notion of getting some sanding media. Think about your, your wood furniture at home, like you're going to refinish it. You want to blend all those surfaces together, right? So you can repaint it, right? That's mm-hmm. basically what we're doing with metal parts. We perceive them. If it's a flat surface, I, I apply some raster patterns, and then it would. You can sit there and visualize the motion plan, and yeah, that looks reasonable. Go, and it would go. Yep. And no teach pendant programming. Um, I don't necessarily have to worry about like drawing stuff on CAD files, um, which you know doesn't necessarily save you time. Those are really meaningful <laughs> demonstrations. Uh, okay. Proof of proof of concepts we were able to do at Caterpillar that got really good buy-in. Um, oh, that's awesome. And then from from there, it continued to grow. Uh, and this notion of collaborative projects and things like that. And then so, about a, a handful of years later, I had the opportunity to kind of, you know, I was drinking enough of the open source Kool Aid and, and this idea of leveraging <laughs> Ross to solve industrial problems. I had a chance to come here uh, and, and take over the Ross industrial project here from my predecessor uh, Paul Boss, and I did that in 2017. Gotcha. And how does it, um, or actually, so one thing is when you're saying um, like collaborative work on these, you mean basically using something like, I don't know, some version control like Git or something so that programmers can work on it at the, at different times and different places and 
kind of all collaborate towards one product. Yeah. Like this kind of thing, you, is this what you mean? <laughs> mind you, like back then, like in our like manufacturing research yeah. group, that was all very new. Like get, get what? Like, right. <laughs> uh, uh, at the time, like, right. So that, that idea of collaborating on software from different locations, when we did that collaborative project in the Ross Industrial sort of family, if you will, the, in, within mm-hmm. the consortium, we partnered with um, Boeing was a performer on that particular project, as well as 3M. Mm-hmm. Uh, Wolf Robotics uh, was like the solution provider out of uh, Fort Collins. They're now part of Lincoln Electric. And of course, us, Caterpillar. And we mm-hmm. all offered like little in-kind contributions. Like oh, we developed, our team developed the Keyance driver for this laser line scanner. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, but to your point, right? It was the first time that we had to script up stuff, put it someplace where other people could merge it in, and 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 that I that see. sort of workflow workflow is very new uh, to a group that was very used to like you know, I'm developing right on the robot controller, right? I'm not yeah. I'm not putting it someplace where it's really truly accessible by others, uh, and, huh. and could be like you know you know it could be reviewed and merge yeah. this notion of, of of that Git workflow, if you will. Um, and that's that's been a slow process. We still work with traditional uh, industrial stakeholders that are still getting up the speed on on that kind of Git workflow. Um, mm. And that's been that's been a fun ride uh, as we talk about software and industrial settings. Obviously, here in early 2020s, I mean, right between the startup communities and the prevalence or emergence of ROS and, and people looking at industrial applications, it's becoming more commonplace. But like mm-hmm. in the early 2010s, it was non-existent you know, almost. We had, to, we had to figure out what GitHub was, right? <laughs> we had to get wow. permission to use it. Right? So, <laughs> uh, yeah, huh. right. Because our corporate IT groups were like, oh, the internet's bad. Like, what is this? <laughs> yeah, the internet's bad. Yeah, you're putting your stuff on there. Yeah. yeah. Huh. It's, it's kind of, a, I mean, so I guess I have, most of my background is in software, I would say. And it is shocking to me to hear that it was, it's like tw- 2010, 10 years ago-ish, um, that like these kind of things that I associate as modern workflows are not being used, but that's very interesting. And so the, the pipeline or how it typically worked, it, it was, um, you have several people that are working on different things and you modularize the problem so that each person can do, or we, each entity can work on one thing and have that one thing do it very well. And then you just combine them and in theory, it works perfectly. Is that is that kind of like the t- traditional way of doing yes. things? Yes, that's probably, a, yeah. So you'd have the person who's doing like the robot programming. You'd have a person who's doing like, let's say there's some sensor on the robot that's got to do some thinking or processing. You'll have the one person who sets that up and programs it. And then um, you have like, say, an electrical engineer who, who slash controls person who might do your PLC and control like electrical panel. Yep. And then, yes, yeah, so then there's an integration sort of period of time where all three of them will come together and try to, like, make sure all their stuff's communicating properly. Wow. Um, that's that's actually, in some regards, still a similar workflow that we use here when we do advanced systems. It's just we've bolted on also the software development piece, right, which which enables us to kind of at least address the interfaces. We can test a lot of the, the interfaces and in message passing, you know, in simulation. We have a few more tools at our disposal than we had 10 years ago. Um, and, and obviously, even though here we're advanced, say compared to traditional manufacturers, um, you know we still have to overcome some of the limitations of the industrial hardware and what, what it'll just support, right? Mm-hmm. Like every every everyone, like no one has like it, it, this notion of a documented API. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, not not really? necessarily, right? Wow. So so there's no so application programmer interface to. Um like use the things kind of clearly. Um, yeah. I mean, well, because again, we well, have to go in their scripting language, just, maybe. Exactly. Just de- stay in our ecosystem, right? That's kind stay of... Stay in our ecosystem. I mean, that's kind of a mantra, if you will, right? So, um, but but that's, it, it's, it's making progress, right? Like, you know, we, <laughs> we were at a conference one time and this guy stood up and raised his hand and he's like, mm-hmm. there was this time... I downloaded Solitaire and my computer got a virus. And now you're telling us to down, download software off the internet and run our robots with it. <laughs> and 
and, and so that's that's where we were starting, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, the industrial sector is, I mean, they've been they've been doing what they do for in automation for what, 50, 60, 70 years in certain cases. Uh, mm-hmm. PLC has been around a long, long time. So yeah. there was resistance, right? It was a real disruption to think about, you know, oh, we're going to bring down some open source pieces, layer on kind of just like the stuff, the novel stuff to do this specific thing, but mm-hmm. then like not reinvent the wheel. And, and like, hey, we're going to maintain it and make contributions back to the stuff in the open source. Because, right, rising tide lifts all boats. And there were yep. some people that were just like, wait, you're going to download stuff off the internet and run an industrial robot? I mean, we, we it took a long time to just define open source, get a consensus of understanding in the industrial community. And it was funny, I, I, had, I sat with a peer in Germany and he's like, you know what? Like the whole, like you can put open source on an industrial piece of equipment and have it do something meaningful in a factory and the whole place not melt or break down. We mm-hmm. won that battle. Like we're doing that now and we are, and mm-hmm. lots of people are. Lots of great startups over there. There's, what is it? There was that one article like, 80% of new startups, whatever the robot they're putting out there, like there's, there's Ross, there's a Ross something. Uh, under yeah, there. it's crazy. I don't know the number either, but it's quite yeah. high, which is nuts. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's great, right? And that, and that, and that was, if we didn't done nothing else, we have brought the industrial sector to the party, right? And, and, huh. and generated some general acceptance for open source and like, hey, you can do this, right? And this can work. Uh, and that's, that's been fun. It's been great to see that change over time. Compared to where, yeah, I have. where we where we were like in the early teens, twenty tens. Yeah, I imagine it's it's pretty exciting to see kind of it coming along in this, and you can probably move a good bit faster when you adopt some of these kind of these, these different development paradigms, like version control, and you can collaborate, and then you can tie it with simulation, and you have all the parts integrated, so you can test them all together, even if it is limited in like say a simulation or something. But you still don't. It's not like this one part. Um, we're only going to test that and then um, we're going to connect it to something that's also only tested by itself. Um, whereas you can like say all of these things are in the, the gazebo simulator and we're just going to run this control code on it and see if it does what we intend it to do. <clears throat> that's quite nice. Absolutely. Okay. So g- going back, so you were at Caterpillar. Um, now... Did, did you go, how, how did you end up at um, Southwest Research Institute? Yeah, so, you know, I, I had been doing my job at Caterpillar, like 10% was this open source, you know, hmm. motion planning, you know, no more teach pen programming robot stuff. Like that was like 10%. <laughs> okay. And, and that was the funnest part of my job, right? And I had all this other stuff. <laughs> and, uh, and I was like, I was kind of like, yeah, looking at different opportunities, right? So I mix it up and mm-hmm. uh, the, the guys here heard and they're like, hey, why, why don't you come down here? And like, you know, I'm like, oh, like run the Ross Industrial Program. Like, you got to be kidding me. I, I don't know anything about this stuff, right? I'm just some guy like running some projects. And they're like, no, no, you have that perspective of the person who, who hates programming robots. <laughs> I'm like, okay, I definitely have plenty of that. Uh, and so, so yeah, I, I, we talked and they, they found a role for me, uh, and I was like, all right, we'll give it a shot. Um, and so I came down in the middle of 2017, um, and, and obviously I, I've brought a, a little different perspective, right? I mean, uh, you know, I, 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 I was putting robots on the factory floor and commissioning them and, and mm-hmm. then like trying to replicate successes on, on certain hardware or, or development configurations and trying to replicate that and really struggling, um, so I brought that. And so when other people had that pain, I was like, oh yeah, we had that pain too. And then like, obviously I come from a peer group where, you know, when someone brings up the, the eight terminals and they're like bouncing between the terminals, I'm like, yeah, like people in the industrial community can't do that now. Mm. <laughs> right. Cause we're not software developers. Mm. Right. Mm. So there was this idea of like, what can we do to, to lower the barrier to entry? And obviously, we've seen a lot of progress on that front, right? Between nice IDEs, um, between, you know, other, like, just more Python, right? Lowers the barrier to entry. Um, yep. You know, there wasn't a ton of Python stuff just, um, back I mean, when we first started poking around. Um, but all of that helps, right? And so that whole lower the barrier to entry is obviously part of our mission as well. Mm-hmm. And just... Uh... 
I, I'm sure people know mostly, but um, so IDE is integrated development <laughs> environment. Yes. And so that's um, like where you code often. And it makes things a lot easier um, if you have a good IDE. Um, and then yes. Python, maybe I don't need to define it, but just a programming language, which um, for Ross, we are a lot of C++, which is low level. And we have some Python, which is like a nice scripting language. Um, yes. And so that's higher level, easier. You can say like print um, quotations high and then close it and it will print that out. And so it's, it's like, it's easier. Um, so it makes it nicer for working because people can just kind of see the logic um, right there. And it's almost like a human readable, like paragraph kind of thing. Almost, yes. Almost. Okay, so one of the big parts of Ross Industrial, you're saying, is lowering that barrier of entry. How are you doing that? Or like, how, well, what are some strategies you guys are working towards to try to lower the barrier of entry? That That's a great question, right? So um, obviously, one of the things we do in our little consortium family is we provide training, right? And the training is constantly evolving uh, based on the feedback from the membership, right? So they want to, they want more examples. Uh, it helps when there's like sort of templates to do certain classes of things. Um, obviously, we've tried to. Um, Can you give me an example? Uh, yeah, maybe. Uh, right, but like <laughs> setting up one a good example is like uh, we have a training on the setting up a perception pipeline. Okay. Right, and then we have a training class where we leverage the the perception pipeline to say like do a pick and place demo. Right, so you perceive this object and you identify a grass point, you go get it. Right, so we have this whole lab exercise that takes place on the, uh, ton, the one of the pieces of hardware that are behind me, um, mm -hmm. and, and and then so they get to like kind of actually build an application, but they they have some a skeleton to start with, right? Mm -hmm. Or we went through an example, right, which can become sort of the template. Yeah, um, that's so how they we can work from set. something that kind of already works. Correct. Mostly. Obviously, like sometimes the feedback is, well, it's just a lot of copy and paste. I don't know what I'm copying and pasting. Uh, uh, but so it's a continuous journey. Uh, and that, but that feedback only makes it better. Um, but obviously, you know, the more, you know, obviously the issue is, you know, I, I mean, the tech world is rapidly evolving all the time. Um, so new things are always coming out. And, and of course, what lags is the documentation and the tutorials. <laughs> Uh, yeah. We're in the same boat where where we've been doing a lot of interesting new work in in reconstruction and in different types of motion planners. We have an optimization based motion planning framework that's out there so now. Are you uh, um, for for all these things? Are you leveraging things that are in ROS two for your navigation? Are you using like Nav two for your motion planning? Are you using like Move it, or is it kind of custom solutions for industry things? Right. So where we next. can, we want to we, we want to stick with with what's out there emerging out of the community, right? Ah. So we really want it's extending ROS into industrial applications. So creating like homegrown stuff kind of defeats the purpose. Now, mm. obviously, there are cases where something uh, special needs to emerge, uh, and thereby we will create that. In a lot of cases, we open source it. Right. So one great example that comes up in, in, in uh, our community is the emergence of Tesseract, which is a motion planning uh, environment. It's very similar to Move It. Uh, it was born out of a very specific use case um, and, and it was chosen to open source it because why not? <laughs> right. Um, yeah. And it's still it's still we 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 all of our training is still built on Move It. We, we start with Move It. Uh, but then for those interested or specific applications, we have this alternative called Tesseract that in certain situations offers some benefits, um, but we don't necessarily offer like, say, training on it. Um, it's sort of like, oh, if your application sort of would benefit from some of the things here, you know, we can do you something can use sort of on demand, right? But but in general, we start with, to your point, right, the nav stack, move it, and the tools therein. Um, mm -hmm. We want people to, because the benefit is, the whole benefit of this whole open source idea is, is that once we start using them, we make contributions back, right? So if we made a bunch of replicates of stuff, well, then we just spread out the contributions and they're less impactful, mm -hmm. right? So we, we want to start and use the most common tools as well. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, yes, yeah, so hence we've migrated our training over to ROS2 as well. We're trying to, as I described earlier, right, the... In the industrial crowd is slow to move, right? Because they like what works. 
So we've been having to be very judicious uh, in how we manage rolling out an introduction of ROS2, um, but, but, but we're getting there. Right. And, hmm. and so more, most recently, we also are trying to revisit hardware interfaces because in the industrial side, that's really lagged. Uh, but it's a good mm. opportunity to revisit for consistency purposes. And we can talk more about that. Yes, for sure. Yeah, that's very interesting. And I want to talk about that. Have you, um, but before, have you, um, is one approach that you guys may do abstracting things further? So if, um, say, I want to move something from here to here, from one location to another, um, maybe I abstract what you need to do in Nav2 or abstract what you need to do and move it or something so that um, it's easier at kind of like, like instead of like a, I'm going to do all, like I, I want to run this specific thing or this set of commands in Nav2, uh, maybe like more at a behavioral level or something, like something that's... That's, like, that's actually, it's interesting, right? So that's some of the, that sort of like, just kind of give a higher order kind of instruction. And yeah, exactly. Empower the, system, or empower the system to make the optimal decision, yeah. right? Because like, let's say we have a mobile manipulator to your point, right? Where nav yep. is involved and move it. I, I don't necessarily want to have to like push out commands to both, right? It needs to be a higher order and then let the system's intelligence sort of figure it Do out. It. Um, or let a bunch right. of smart programmers figure it out once and then everyone gets to benefit from it. Co correct. And we are we are trying to bring to some proof of concept capabilities in that space to present to, like, say, the manufacturing engineer mm -hmm. uh, who knows process. They know what they have to do in their factory. But mm -hmm. is it going to, to your point, command, yep. move it, or nav, right? They're going to yeah. be able to tell it, like, hey, you need to do it like this. And just go do that, right? Mm -hmm. and, and abstract away, if you will, that most not of lowest it. level, but, but that le next level down. We, yeah. we have some proof of concept initiatives going in that direction. We have uh, put out some material on those and, and some of the progress we're making. So uh, for those interested, uh, you know, if you when you share the LinkedIn stuff, you'll see posts about some of the outcomes from some of those group meetings that talk cool. about uh, some of the work going on, what we call our development environment for industrial mm -hmm. applications. Uh, and that's something we're looking to hopefully find some people to poke holes at and, and try. And so we're looking for some beta testers now. Um, and we're hoping that helps some of our industrial stakeholders uh, lower the barrier. To, again, that whole idea mm -hmm. of lowering the barrier, particularly as the systems yep. get more complex. Oh, of course. We deal yes. Not just mobile, but we'll do, we do a lot with gantry-based systems. And that's where a manipulator oh. may be inverted up da upside down, and it's in a huge gantry that has X, Y, Z, and it can yep. take that manipulator through an entire volume. Uh, I'm imagining a 3D it's... printer with an arm instead of the printing spot. Yeah, absolutely. Something like and that. That's a, that's, a, that's a great example. Um, and, and so obviously you have all the redundant axes. There's lots of solutions. How do you, how do you search that space, right? And so what are the yeah. tools for that? How do you prioritize using the axes and sorry, gantry axes versus the manipulator axes. Mm. Um, I mean, so, you know, we're, we're trying to bring tools to kind of enable end users to, to, to take advantage that of this. Thing. That's interesting. I don't, I don't know much about use cases for gantries with the robotic arms on them or anything. That seems quite cool. Um, have you, I don't, I, I did an interview um, earlier with Brett Aldrich um, from Smack. Have you thought of their... Like, have you looked at Smack for kind of like a higher level um, way of controlling robots for specific tasks? It, it kind of seems like their use case. Yeah. So it's interesting you mentioned Brett and Smack. Uh, I had to, today is Friday. It, so yesterday, I was uh -huh. at the technical steering committee meeting talking about hardware interfaces mm -hmm. and, and how we'd like to do a new reference implementation to kind of herd the cats uh, on hardware interfaces. And Brett yep. pinged me after that particular meeting oh. and said, like, hey, we should we should talk about Smack. I was like, that's a great idea. So yeah. other than like reading reading like three lines about it, I, I have immersed myself um, derelict on catching up on some of my reading. Uh, I've only caught wind of Brett and his work since he was um, getting engaged with the technical steering committee for Ross yep. too. Uh, Being so, one of the community members for sure. Correct. Yeah. And, and obviously, like when I read his application, I was like, yeah, this guy. This guy's talking the awesome. right stuff. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so, <laughs> so we're excited, and and I'm glad he reached out to me, and, and I look forward to learning more about Snack. Yeah, it's probably it could be 
and again, much, you know, we've had folks like Brett come speak to our industrial audience. Um, mm. and, and so there, those opportunities are exist. Like we are just trying to, I, I, I have a hard time keeping up and I'm like in the Ross world more oh, regularly. Totally. My, yeah. My, move so my fast in all directions. And, and less so. Right. So mm-hmm. you know, where, where it makes sense, I try to, in some of our organizations though, like stodgier, right. Kind of old school. Uh, they do have people that, that really are, are looking for solutions um, mm-hmm. and, and like to hear from these types of people, right? So we try to, we do a lot of that matchmaking. Um, cool. But obviously, if there's a chance to collaborate, we, we would love to see that. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. I, if you maybe some help with the background, but if you're speaking with them anyway, um, there's a previous podcast interview with where I interviewed cool. Brett. And we went into like pretty deep detail on how Smack works and where it might be useful. But um, so now you're at Southwest at the Southwest Research Institute, SWERI, um, and you're leading Ross Industrial from there. And you have a bunch of projects and a team. Or how, what's the setup and how how does it work and how does the organization? <laughs> so, so that's work? a great great question. Right. So we have uh, this manufacturing robotics department here at, at the institute, yeah, and they leverage all these tools in their day to day problem solving. Right. So mm-hmm. they're kind of like the Ross Industrial Developing Team, if you will, or, or contributors to the Ross Industrial Open Source Project, but they're users as well. Um, cool. And we, we try to walk the talk. Right. So we take all these things and we go solve problems with them. Now, <clears throat> how large and so, what's the business model? And is it tied to a company and a bunch of things well, like this? Because so, I don't quite understand. Um, right. Swery. So essentially, essentially, the institute at a high level, right, which has about eleven operation, operating divisions. Um, mm-hmm. One of the most well known is the space science uh, division, right? Because they they actually have a mission control here and lead missions for NASA. Uh, hmm. There's a couple different. Uh, the New Horizons was one where they kind of went by and did some shots of Pluto. Um, cool. So space science and and then a. Here in our division, right? So I'm in a department. Our division is three of us: one, unmanned ground systems for applied sensing, uh, and then critical systems does a lot of the NASA software. And of mm-hmm. course, we collaborate with them as well and try to share tips and practices and where Ross makes sense. Yeah. Um, but anyways, so there's it's all applied engineering, contract R and D. Um, actually, when I was at Caterpillar, um, we spent a lot of time here doing dyno testing. Right, so about half of Caterpillar's dyno testing occurs here at Southwest Research Institute. It's twenty five hundred acres. Uh, sorry, yeah. So it's when they take an engine and mm-hmm. they basically try to run it. <laughs> like so, they they put all these they put fuel they plumb fuel into it. They make sure the exhaust is handled effectively, but it just sits there on a stand and runs. They put it through its paces. They may uh, they may make the they may make the room very cold. They may make the room very hot. So they can um, test all the different conditions while running the yeah, engine. I see. My, see where my it interest fails, was. Or... Correct. I was supporting uh, on highway tier three emissions at the time for oh. on highway trucks. So Interesting. tier three was at the time they were trying to ad- address diesel particulate. Um, so I was the materials person involved with a lot of the creation of some of the components for the that particular exhaust system at the time. And so they were running a lot of those tests here. So, but it's but it's multidiscipline, right? So I mentioned space science, mm-hmm. obviously. We're manufacturing robotics. We have unmanned ground systems. Uh, you know, so we have all these different groups. Um, and, gotcha. and, and so, and effectively consulting acres. around these. Um, yeah. Like a ge- or, you have like because I you say different domains, but I assume it's like um, fairly similar competencies bef- between the different domains, or at least complementary in some sense. Yeah. So, you know, I, I mean, you're, there's a lot of computer science across the Institute, uh, mm-hmm. a lot of material science folks like myself, but mostly in the mechanical engineering division, mm-hmm. um, a lot of mechanical engineers, uh, a lot of chemists. We have a whole chemistry division as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so, but we basically think back to my group at Caterpillar. I worked at corporate research. Uh, this group had unique skills that I didn't have software skills in my manufacturing research group explicitly. Mm. I had some people who could do some Python. So we would work with this team. We'd write a little contract and they worked as like an extension uh, of my corporate R&D team. I and they could work to, to some statement of work and help my team out. And, and very much like I like to describe it, if we work for, with somebody, we mm-hmm. want to leave them uh, not just with something we give them, but but their staff is a little bit better at using the tools than they were before we showed up. 
right? So we don't just deliver them something, we teach them while we work with them. It's part of the um, delivery to teach them in a sense. Yeah, I mean, here we are using all these open source tools. We want, we, I don't want to just give you a software and we will, but ideally you have someone in your team who can learn it as well uh, and mm-hmm. be self-sufficient. So you don't necessarily totally. have to come back to us. Oh, definitely. And that's yeah. that's sort of the model here. And that, that proliferates around the Institute, right? The whole, there's a tagline about benefiting uh, science and humanity. Uh, so we try to walk that talk, right? Uh, Mm -hmm. We try to help our partners, teach our partners, uh, as well as like deliver novel solutions. Um, And the cool thing about unique about our department specifically and our division is is we don't just deliver the novel solution, but we also try to make contributions or offer things in the open source. So hence a lot Mm -hmm. of the robot drivers, some of the calibration utilities, uh, they they were born out of this group specifically, Mm -hmm. as well as some of our partner groups. Um, Ross Industrial is stewarded by three organizations. You've mentioned Southwest Research Institute, but I'd be remiss not to mention Fraunhofer IPA in Stuttgart, Germany, and the Advanced Remanufacturing Technology Center in Singapore, who steward wow. Ross Industrial Europe and Ross Industrial Asia Pacific, respectively. Um, those organizations also make great contributions to open source and, and of course, Ross, Ross 2 and Ross Industrial. Gotcha. Uh, can you tell me a bit about the consortium around Ross Industrial? Right. So in 2013, and actually, you know, 2013 is when it first got started. Like, there's a lot you can work on, right? Like, so we had all these problems of just getting the the robot, like getting my application to work on all these different robots. But there's all this other stuff, like, right? Should we be doing motion planning? Should we be? What about perception? What to focus on, basically? (laughs) Right. There's a there's a million things that you could possibly focus on. Okay. Yeah, my my predecessor. Yeah, my predecessor, Paul Voss. Now Mm -hmm. plus one. He, he he basically was like started like basically surveying industry and he's like hey what are some of your pain points and, and what, what should we be working on and mm-hmm. it just naturally sort of like like hey what if we started a consortium and you chip in a little bit and we start building up this repository and maintain it and for tools to enable but you chip in a little it. bit you mean you fund a little bit so that yeah. um, like so you have some sort of stake and it funds like a few people to work on this uh, full time yeah, or so most of their time that's the intent of the consortium, right? So there's some level of maintenance uh, to keep things at least running to a degree. Mm-hmm. So um, our membership dues are, are so running to a degree. Reasonable. Yeah. Um, okay. And, and then, um, and then that enables like some level of technical support. So one of the ben- benefits for people who are involved in the consortium uh, is they get some call like, "Hey, help me!" <laughs> like tech support. Uh, uh-huh. as well as like, you know, we, we do a lot of maintenance and of course, obviously pushing out some new stuff, fixes, um, uh, new versions, et cetera. We maintain the QT plugin for Ross, um, mm. and, and different functions like that. Um, and put on obviously the training, it supports the, the training events that we put on. And that's, mm. that's really what the dues cover. Any sort of collaborative project is separately spec'd out. And if people want to contribute in kind in software or, or just, fun labor, they can do that. But that's usually spun out separate. So the consortium seeks to provide the direction for what we do in the open source. Um, so it's, and at first they, oh, sorry. It's a um, direction in a sense that they inform you of what they're working on and what their needs are, but it also comes with these added benefits of um, you, you can, you support them and then you also provide these training um, things. Tra- training, uh, yes. I don't know, the courses or however you may refer to it. The training events, right? And events, of course we'll, yeah. We enable them to sort of like kind of influence the agenda. Like, oh, yeah. it'd be nice to have more more on navigation, right? Oh, we more. should probably... Uh, like we started pushing out ROS2 training and we got a lot of feedback that like, hey, this is fine, but like how do we make it run with our ROS1 stuff, That's right? So we ooh, had to kind painful. of like add, it, yeah. add in like, <laughs> yeah, add in like best practices with the bridge and, porting gotcha. exercises and like, hey what are some things for to help us port stuff and and, and gotcha. so that that's and that and that's a key role right i mean oh, for the, sure. the consortium the membership like provides this sort of well and, and because they are paying membership dues they they will definitely express their opinions and, and that's what we want <laughs> right i mean for sure if a yes, stakeholder so you can best match desires of industry represented by the consortium <clears throat> yeah so we have like this like baked in voice of voice of the customer Right. So huh. that's been really good. And then shortly after we started the Americas Consortium, uh, Fraunhofer IPA stood up the Ross Industrial Consortium Europe. 
cool. where they have a subset of members uh, in Asia Pacific, uh, like I said, led out of uh, Singapore. ARTC up Singapore, uh, where I you know one of your colleagues, a couple of your colleagues sit in Singapore, I think just down the road from ARTC. Uh, they, 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 they support the uh, Asia Pacific Consortium. And, but we work all off like a common agreement. So mm. we have reciprocal benefits and it's really very uniform uh, from either outside uh, as well as inside. We try to make it gotcha. very consistent, uniform experience. Like very often I'll have an Asia Pacific member who has someone sitting here in the States and they'll attend our training and that's, that's totally cool. Huh, okay, that's nice. <clears throat> How do you... Um... So how, how does it work when companies join the consortium? Is it, um, so is it like a fixed due or can companies, so like if, I don't know, I, like say it's a $5,000 for one seat or something. Um, does it, can, is, can someone contribute a whole bunch and basically monopolize how it works or how, how does all, I, I guess, how do you balance that's, different companies? <laughs> that's a good question. So, so we do, that we have an agreement, right? And the agreement spells out all the, the details. <clears throat> but in general, right, we have different classes of membership, which try to make it as accessible as possible. So like startups and universities can come in at $2,500 a year. They get a seat at every event, be it networking or training. Yep. Um, and, they, and they still get to like, say like, you know, um, provide feedback on the roadmap. Now we have uh, another level, which is called the Consortium Advisory Council. Um, and that's reserved for like our full members, but they mm -hmm. each only still get a seat, right? Okay. So like, even though like a, a big heavy hitter may come in, right? And be like, right? Like, hey, we want, want it to be this. I'm like, well, you've only got one vote, right? It's thank yeah. you for that vote, but it's only one vote. <laughs> um, okay. But in the case, like obviously some members abstain, um, so they're happy to go with like, if the big hitter comes in and says X. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> obviously in the recent years, the dynamic is, of the consortium has evolved to quite a bit. <laughs> Yeah. Um, we ran it kind of a little bit more like, like us industry folks who used to running, right. With like email and like, but now like we have, um, we had a, a nice tech infusion into the consortium Ooh. and they're ready to develop via sprints and like what I work on like, <laughs> discourse. And I've been like having to like my old school members, I'm like having to, this is discourse. Yeah. It's okay. Right. You can go out there and type something. Yeah. And it's, a, it's been a, it's it's bringing those two worlds together. It's been a while. That is interesting. But, but but yeah, everyone has the one vote. And I still call like, let's have a Zoom meeting, and I send them an invite, and, mm -hmm. and it's it's still um, a lot of handholding, but it's fun, right? I mean, I I I know the contacts of every member uh, pretty personally, right? I, I've had one on one conversations with all of them. They express their concerns. Like sometimes they're like. I don't know if this is the fit for us and, and that's okay. Right. I want to make sure that yeah, everyone feels like they're, getting the, they're getting the value um, and, and that we're meeting their needs. And if they're not, they're not, we're not. Right. And that's fine too. Oh, totally. Um, and I'll get like, well, can you put me in touch with the person who does Ross eye marketing? I'm like, yes, one second. And then I just put right. back up again. It's me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? yeah. I, I'm the, uh, I'm the one-stop shop. Like, right. I, yeah, I manage the website. I, I do all the marketing. I you wear a lot of hats for events. I'm the guy on the podcast. <laughs> yeah, I <laughs> right. know. Well, that's oh. not entirely true, right? Our developer group. Um, some of you, your, your your audience may know Levi Armstrong, right? So he has spoken uh, with our his our, our member team member, our team members, Michael Ripperger, just recently she spoke at Roscon. We put on a yep. workshop. Uh, was Levi Armstrong and Dr. Chris Lewis. Gotcha. Uh, on, on the scanner. So you don't wear all the hats, but you wear many hats. Yeah. Jorge Nico was on the Ross Developers podcast that comes out of Spain. Mm -hmm. um, so, so you know, I, I really try to provide the forum uh, to, to allow the team to shine. Uh, mm -hmm. But obviously, I was invited and I'm happy to talk about the program level, but obviously, I'm happy to make uh, somebody a little bit more developer centric available as well. <sighs> okay. Let's see. So then. Um... Okay, so you have the consortium. It's all these companies that sit on it. How how large is it? Uh, how many companies do you have sitting on? And I guess you have the three different branches, but like some right. idea. In, in general, somewhere in like the 65 member company range, including wow. government entities. So um, government entities don't have to pay a member fee, but they have to kind of, they don't get any of the member benefits. So they have to pay if they show up for like a meal. You know, ah, so, I see. But, um, so like NIST is a really great partner uh, here in the States side. 
Um, so we've been really benefited that really good working relationship with them, Air Force Research Lab, um, you know, uh, in, in TARDAC or Army Research. Uh, gotcha. Historically, have been ones that, that have really been great supporters of the work we're trying to do in industrial open source. Yeah. I'm curious. So like um, my experience with some nonprofit, so I was with RoboHub, which is a nonprofit news organization for robotics. Um, and so we would go around and try to find sponsors quite often. Um, are you, so for the companies that you have in the consortium, are you doing a lot of like reaching out to different companies and trying to kind of align or try try to talk to the right people and then um, have them join or how does it how does it work with this or are they coming to you like i suppose it's a mix of both but uh, yeah. just the approach there. <laughs> I, I i have to admit like i could probably do more proactive outreach um you know even we were at caterpillar like they mentioned like hey we have this consortium you can participate mm -hmm. um you know a lot of times people reach out to us you know, like for instance, if if you have like say like say there's a more tech oriented company that like wants to get exposure to industry, they might reach out. Um, oh. And then like you know, for instance, if like uh, like when I was at Caterpillar, we needed help but wanted to learn ourselves, right? So it was a good opportunity for us to get exposure to the training and what's going on. Who are others? Um, what are others doing to solve some of these challenges? Um, and, and ideally, there's other some solution providers in that network that that are already industry aligned, right? Because the issue with working with a lot of startups sometimes, at least in the early 2010s, they weren't always really ready for industry. The too point. early, kind of thing. Um, they they were still and, like pivoting and whatever it might be. Yeah, or, or or they were overfit to say their initial industry, like automotive, uh, for instance. Um, and, and so, like obviously, hanging out in Ross Industrial, we can kind of like. You know these other startups that were kind of engaging they can kind of get a little sense for 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 the flavor of industrial member that's in the consortium I, most mm -hmm. of the industrial members in the consortium are you know hence there is no ford or well general motors is a member now uh, but not in the context you might think um but like you know ford at one time early on was a member but they're like yeah we can just tell the robot providers what to do right so this is less valuable <laughs> Oh, um, yeah, yeah, the big companies. But they are looking for more and more scale. advanced capability, right? It's interesting, mm -hmm. right? So even big players like that, uh, BMW, right? It's been a long oh, time. Oh, totally. Because um, oh, wow. they're trying to do, there's this notion of lot size of one. And, and so that, even though you're making of like say, thousands of cars, a lot size of one. So you're making, what does it mean? I'm making, I'm making 500 units a minute, right? Normally, I might make batches. So let's, mm -hmm. let's grab, why not, why not BMW, right? So I'm going to make a, 500 of these 700 series four door sedans, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm going to have them be the same. And then I'm going to follow it up with a bunch of my 500 series product. Well, wh what they're trying to get to is this notion of, of all the product they make, they're going to make 500 of them, but it's going to be all mixed, sprinkled and mixed, different oh, colors, different I shapes, see. different sizes. It's, an SUV for followed customization. By it's like, yes. uh, it's highly dynamic to the needs of the company. So it might right. be like, I, it might be like in the in the limit. It might be like in like Walmart or something when someone buys a product and then Walmart ships that product to the Walmart store, kind of thing, because of that data being taken. So the, if someone wants either. this car, sends it right Correct. over. Right, just in time manufacturing, just, just in time, time. delivery, uh, just uh, just in time tagline, and in, in, in like Six Sigma parlance, uh, supply chain <laughs> speed is very uh, common in industry. And there's tool sets here in the Ross toolbox that can help deliver solutions for that's that. what you mean a lot of one for this it's like i want to make yeah. one of one thing um and then yeah. i want to go make something else right this kind of thing you can you know, historically you would batch it right uh, yeah. i'm going to make so many of the 700 series so many of the five 500 series so many of the 300 series to, to optimize my uptime but manufacturers are really wanting to get away from that they want that just in time manufacturing interesting yeah okay <laughs> and so and that's and that's true Aerospace, uh, heavy industry, oil and Probably gas. Probably all industries. Automotive. I yeah. mean, it's basically What's saying difference? I want flexibility, is what I hear. Yeah, that's right. Or, or agility, which is or, you know same. different yet similar. Oh. <laughs> How do you think of them? Because I mean, flexibility so, is the ability to pivot and make different things. Agility is the ability to change quickly what you're making. Yeah. So you might trade off velocity uh, in an agile solution, right? So 
flexibility, right? So, oh boy, without getting to manufacturing lingo. <laughs> so, so if I'm machining engine blocks, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, let's say I make lots of different engines, different sizes, lawn mowers to dump trucks. Um, mm-hmm. I can I can buy a machining center with a huge material handling setup with all the, the the holding hardware to hold all my different size engines. And that way I can put all the metal blocks I need on these like pallets that are shuttled around. That's a very flexible system, but mm-hmm. it's also very expensive, right? Cause like I've got this like <laughs> conveyor system, I've got all this extra tooling. Yep. An agile solution might be, I have a mobile robot with a spindle on it that can like brace it and stay. Do everything, itself. but it might be slow. Like it can roll, it can roll up on the various engine blocks and put all the holes in it needs. That's uh. an agile solution. Now it's not going to make each one as fast because it's a little robot and it's not as rigid. But, but, but I, have less, I have I have less setup. I have like you know I, I, my floor space can be very dynamic. I don't have this huge thing that takes up the space in my factory. That is an agile solution, right? So this notion mm-hmm. of to your point, right? I can respond more nimbly to changes in condition. Flexible mm-hmm. means I've designed my equipment to handle all my permutations. Yep. But maybe oh. I need some of the trade offs on consuming floor space or capital. And maybe investment. it's flexible only in what you're already making and not flexible in new things, too, where maybe yeah. agile could adapt more readily. Okay. There's actually a, an agility and robotics working group in NIST. And we, we, we talk extensively about the de- defining agility, right? It's a real nice conversation. <laughs> it's an actually official IEEE working group. So oh, if interesting. any of your listeners are interested in that, I'm happy to make introductions or, you know, through one of okay. the communication channels. Well, at the end, you can drop your <laughs> contact info and everything. And But um, what, one thing kind of, so you mentioned this working group. Um, you had a working group approved in the steering committee yesterday. Um, well, that's, that's fresh off the presses. <laughs> fresh off the press, yeah. And uh, so uh, would you talk a bit about the intention of the working group and then like maybe how people would get involved if they are interested? Yeah. So <laughs> this is all still very new, right? So anyway, so, yep. it, so, so you approved yesterday in brought, the steering committee meeting. Look at <laughs> this. Uh, you're up, you're very plugged in. Um, yeah. <laughs> so yes, the, the, the technical steering committee met yesterday. We had put on discourse, this idea of a hardware interfaces working group. So one of the exciting things about our work with industry in Ross is the notion of being able to abstract away the hardware uh, to enable like, hey, I can run this on a yellow robot and a blue robot. Um, but one thing we've seen over time from our experience in ROS1 is OEMs, some OEMs uh, did pick up the initiative to build their own interfaces for ROS. Others mm, did not, but the community would step in and offer something. Well, and then over time, some OEMs would offer like this totally different type of interface. So, right. And you mean like, software okay, interface. Have- for this, right? Yes, correct. So you're meaning if some company builds a depth stamp sensor or something, right. um, maybe they would write drivers for it, and maybe those drivers could have a ROS interface so you can use it really well with the ROS ecosystem. Um, but maybe it wouldn't, um, is what you're saying with this. Okay, well, so yeah. that interface. So, but, but the behavior would be oh. not consistent, right? So you would have a ROS driver, and mm-hmm. you would expect it to be like, well, when I worked on this hardware, this sort of, this is the type, this type of message usually resulted in this behavior. So if I have a depth we, camera by this co- company A and a depth camera by company B, the ideally the drivers have the same interfaces. So I can just plug and replace one if I'm using, like say I'm using A, I can just swap to B and my interface is the same. So there's no standardization that, in the interfaces yeah, for similar sensors tried, is what you're saying? Correct, yes. Or yeah. similar and, devices. And, and, and industrial manipulators that, that became in spades, right? So, yeah. Uh, and, and because, you know, and obviously because they are different, but and our driver specification when authored at the time didn't think about how those products would evolve. Um, and it wasn't necessarily even associated with, it just defined messages. Mm. Uh, we didn't actually say like associate it with behavior. Mm. And so it's this notion of taking our specifications that we worked on in the past and maybe extending it to behavior. So when you're developing your application, you, you know, the interface, and we want to create a reference implementation that makes it easier for people who are, hey, great, awesome that people are offering ROS interfaces, right? Uh, Mm -hmm. and building interfaces to enable open source interoperability at all. Um, But, but 
if we can do something where like provide reference implementations that are associated with behavior, anticipated or, or expected behavior, we think that would lead to a better developer or end user experience, um, particularly yeah, as we're broadening the tech. And also easier uh, for software engineers. Like Absolutely. it's easier if I have an interface to program to, and I, like if that abstraction is already done, so I don't have to reinvent it. If I am thinking I'm going to end up switching depth cameras at some point, and it's just good practice to make it so you abstract it. Um, but so just baking that in. How how are you guys proposing to do that? So I have to admit I didn't not write the details of the proposal. Uh, I just know like I've dealt with the inconsistency in the interfaces. Oh, totally. uh, uh, but, and but, you're trying to uh, fix it for ROS2, so the ecosystem correct. doesn't develop quite as much as ROS1 without um, establishing a better norm for Guard how to handle it. Guardrails. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so the, what we're going to do is obviously we're going to revisit a lot of the different applicable standards. So there's been some good standards work in this domain. Mm -hmm. Uh, particularly in the industrial side. So we know in Europe, uh, there's been a few different standards. I don't, I can't rattle them off the top of my head, bear with me. But um, there's gonna be a standards review. Obviously, we'd like to take some of the best in class, if you will, mm -hmm. start there, uh, and then maybe like try to benchmark them against a couple of the other implementations we've seen out there. And, and again, target it around like how we handle messaging for like, again, we're gonna start with industrial manipulators because that's mm -hmm. been a pain point for us. and. And, and how we how we handle like say like the streaming and you know the joint streaming and, and then you know how we manage yeah. some of the behaviors resulting to like hey that that didn't really go off like I expected uh, and then how do we make sure we create a reference implementation that works over a different ca couple cases and because yeah. some OEMs are going to also add on functionality yeah we got to make sure the reference implementation accounts for that so they can bolt that in without yeah. necessarily. So it, it, it works with the existing data structure. So you basically say, oh, well, we expect that you might have these additional like fields of data that you're going to pass everywhere. Um, and so it's Correct. built into a standard interface rather than we keep having to extend it for specific use cases, this kind yes. of thing. I, and I think your metaphors around depth cameras are a little simpler to speak around and, and are valid. Absolutely. Uh, very similar. And. Okay. Um, so yeah, we're looking forward. We've we've got some good feedback. The discourse conversation, obviously, TSC. We, you know, TSC. You may not know, but TSC meetings are very fast paced. You can't really belabor any one subject too much. Um, but mm -hmm. in general, there seem to be a receptive audience. Obviously, we're asked how we're going to sustain. I mm -hmm. think that's a very fair question. We, as with anything, uh, open source projects, we tend to get a lot of interest up front, and then it kind of mm -hmm. can peter down. So I think as long as we get a, sort of a core group. Um, I think the big thing is having access to hardware. We're, we're lucky that we have plenty of hardware around. The couple mm -hmm. of the other partners that voiced interest have access to hardware, and that's a great place to start. Um, but obviously, we're going to be looking for other folks who maybe only have like a very specific piece of hardware to test. And mm -hmm. obviously, we'll do our engagement with our OEM friends uh, to see what their take is. Because we have a number of OEMs interested in building out interfaces for us, too. They don't know where to start. And so that's where also the timing is beneficial. Well, we'll hand you this reference implementation, right? Yep. Go and get from feedback here, and right? go from there. So since we, yeah, we have some industrial manipulator OEMs interested in, in rolling out, uh, and they're already looking at ROS2 control. Um, so that's good. And that's that's where it really gets into like behavior, right? Because a lot of our past drivers were a little bit more simplified. Mm -hmm. uh, but now that everyone's pivoting to ROS control based drivers, it's the right time to, to, to look this. a bit more at this more behavior centric approach. Yep. <clears throat> huh. Do you um, see, uh, are you considering like, will you write a Ross enhancement proposal for this kind of thing? Or um, like, do, do you imagine like making a public specification of exactly what these may look like? Or maybe it's like for mobile manipulate or for manipulators. Um, yeah, I, I have a feeling it'd be more uh, specification based, if you will. Um, like I said, we we would like to go back and review existing standards as opposed to creating the standard that supposedly rules them all mm -hmm. in the industrial circles, right? Someone's always creating the standard that New tops standard. all the other standards. I'd like to avoid that. For sure. Uh, <laughs> and the meaty part is the reference implementation, right? So we obviously we'll have a, a wiki page, some place to steer people to for like, and of course, an associated GitHub repository that came, contains the framework for whatever yeah. the reference implementation looks like. Um, but ideally, right, we are bolting in the applicable standards, not reinventing standards, yeah. but 
the, it'd be more around the, the proper documentation as opposed to like us maybe making like under the hood ROS enhancements per se. Right. These are do, you know, do you know what I mean by ROS enhancement proposal? And a rep. Yes. Yeah. Rep. Um, okay. But I, I don't, I don't know necessarily to explicitly become a rep I, at this point in time. Maybe. Gotcha. But, Perhaps once the feedback, it's just, um, so in, as far as I understand, it's really nice if anything, it's a, it's a space that the community looks to see if there are standards for things. And so it seems like a good spot for like, this is what we think would be good for a, um, say we're doing like a, a robotic arm. This is what a good message type for a vendor might be, but I don't know. Just a, uh, that's thought. a good point. Obviously it's been challenging because so many different specifications. A lot of our robot, our robot vendors don't necessarily, they don't know what a rep is, <laughs> right? It's so, true. so, so, you know, we, we, we tend to try to find places that they're more accessible to some of the more traditional industrial segments. I, I think, gotcha. yeah, we'll have to take, we'll have to take that all under consideration. I believe now that you, when we talk about it out loud, mm -hmm. uh, the rep does sound like a great place and it can obviously be pushed and referenced to other places. Yes, totally. I think it, it kind of seems like, a good way to go if you're trying to change how a large group of users might use ROS. It's like the way to have standards, as far as I understand. And also, um, reference implementations are very important in reps. So I think um, if you're making a rep reference implementation, it's like the part of the rep that is the content. You have your reference implementation and the spec and everything out, the rationale, everything. I quite like the form. Um, of it and like filling that space out seems good to me. But no, anyway. see, this is the this is the benefit of of this uh, particular podcast. I'm learning <laughs> a lot as well. Right? Oh, yeah. So no, I like I said, and obviously as we begin this journey, I think we'll probably hash through uh, some of those some of those mm -hmm. decisions too. For sure. And the the rep sounds like to me like yeah, a natural a, a natural step forward. <clears throat> Let's see. So we are coming at the end of the time. I do have. Some other questions, if you do not have a hard stop, I'd love to talk a little longer. I know we started late because of technical difficulties, but. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I've got, yeah, I can, I can go another 10, 10, 12 minutes. It's good. Okay. Uh, so the thing that, uh, so looking at Ross Industrial, the group in general, uh, there's a lot of things that are offered. Um, I, one other thing is the conference um, Ross Industrial Con, or how how do you call it? So, so we have a, three different events because we're like a federated organization with Europe yep. and Asia Pacific. So we each each group puts on like sort of a, a member gathering, if you will. Uh, oh, in a lot of cases, this is the events that you were speaking about. <laughs> okay, right, and then we obviously do some other smaller events as well. But these are kind of like our big marquee events for each region. So mm -hmm. Ross Industrial Conference is specifically that of that name is the one that's typically held at the end of the year. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's being considered moved up away from December, but typically it's in December and it's uh, hosted by uh, Ross Industrial Europe and Fraunhofer IPA and typically in Stuttgart, <coughs> Germany. Mm -hmm. And they are, they'll organize typically their event uh, as both member and public uh, over the whole event. <coughs> Mm -hmm. And obviously bring together lots of different speakers, right? And so mm -hmm. theirs tends to be conference in a very traditional sense where it's a number of different speakers. Maybe they'll have um, some tours and, and have people set up demonstrations as well to make it a yeah. little more interactive. Um, so that's once a year. Asia Pacific hosts what they call a uh, Ross Industrial Workshop, Ross Industrial Asia Pacific Workshop. And it, it is probably somewhat similar uh, I believe it is also public and member over the whole time. Uh, yeah. They may have some separate member breakout time. It's been a while since we've had one in person because of COVID. COVID, for uh, sure. But our, our group, we 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 go over to Singapore. We support that one uh, actively as well. And then, of course, uh, Americas. We typically host ours in the spring. Uh, mm -hmm. It is moving a little later this year because in the every other year we were co-locating with the Automate conference. Uh, oh. And this year, Automate is uh, in June because they're separating from Promat, uh, which mm. used to be in the spring. And in Chicago, Automate is now splitting off uh, separate from Promat and will be in Detroit. Mm. Uh, our event is a little different. Uh, when we host it here in San Antonio, we have kind of public day and then member only day. 
Like, because mm -hmm. when I get all the members together, uh, we tend to try to have workshops where like, hey, what are we doing good? What's not going so well? More reflective now that you have everyone together. What, yeah. What are your burning needs? And so we like get out the get out the huge notepads and we're like yeah. got everybody in little small groups and, and that's cool. And, and we try to we try to hash out things in like just a smaller setting. Uh, the public yeah. day is like a big conference. We usually have like lab tours. Like members will come and set up set up demos. People can play with stuff. We try to make oh, it very super interactive. Cool. Uh, oh, and, yeah. and of course we do the we do the presentation gamut as well. Uh, last year, ours was virtual as well. Um, and thanks to all of our members and, and, and folks in the open source community who came and supported and spoke, um, mm -hmm. folks from Open Robotics as, as well. Um, we really appreciate the support and the collaboration. It's been fun, obviously, bringing all these. It's great to get all these folks together sharing ideas. Um, and we look forward to kind of getting back in person. So our event is oh, yeah, in Detroit. Sure. Uh, Automate runs from Monday through Thursday, and then our event is Friday in Detroit. Nice. Um, we're doing a big a big dinner Thursday. We're going to highlight all the raw centric uh, demos at Automate on the show floor. Mm -hmm. So we'll put out a little cheat sheet, like, hey, if you want to see something with Ross running under the hood, go here, here, and here. Oh, uh, nice. And then of course we'll we'll get together Friday and, and and share kind of some of the happenings, what's going on in our collaboration projects, blah 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 blah. And mm -hmm. so that'll be in June. And we, we make all of that content, uh, some member only content, obviously there's a member portal, but most of it, I'd say like 80% of the content we put up on our YouTube channel. Uh, and of course we make all the slide decks available. Uh, nice. and then we'll do write-ups about like kind of what we learned and stuff and try to get that information out there. <laughs> gotcha. Have you any, have you noticed any, like how, what have you noticed? Um, how, how long have these conferences been going? Is it um, several years or since the consortium in 2013 or? Yeah. So the first con Ross Industrial Consortium member meeting was in 2013. I attended my mm. first one in 2014. Oh, wow. You're so uh, early on it. Okay. So, uh, yeah, as, as a Caterpillar person, right? So, yep. And then um, I hosted my first one as, a, as here. I think it was 2018 uh, mm -hmm. I officially hosted. Um, How, what? What have you noticed for the, like, is it growing? Because I, so going to robotics conferences in the last 10 years or so, um, they've just gotten huge. Are you noticing a similar trend or any yeah, trend I, across the years? Our, I think, you know, we, we typically have to cap it like around, like when I do it here, I have to cap it around like 110. It looks mm -hmm. like at Detroit, I'm going to have to cap it around 100. Mm -hmm. um so it it just fills up faster right um that's cool like any conference like we'll get like in certain cases like you know over registrants i, I think in general people want to come and see what's going on and particularly if there's a lot of demos or chance to get hands on uh, yeah. that drives a lot of a lot of interest um it's definitely not as big as roscon right it's we're more oh, of a yeah. niche audience um but we we have good industry engagement good engagement with the tech community it's a great time for those two sometimes still very different communities to get together and share ideas. Yeah. All right. So uh, beginning to wrap up, um, where do you see Ross industry going or Ross industrial going in the next two, five years? Like where do you think it'll go? Yeah, I think we're at a real tipping point um, where it's not just like say a custom application for industrial use mm -hmm. um, that, that gets deployed at, like at site X we're, we're, I think we're reaching a point where at least certain classes of applications can be sort of generalized. And this notion of like creating like an app for a class of applications, we may be able to realize that, right? Where you can that pull down, super cool. like pull down something via Snap uh, for those mm -hmm. who, Snap is like sort of the app store for Linux. Um, you can pull or something Ubuntu down. Ubuntu specifically. I don't know if it's all Linux. Or, yes. Sorry, it is Ubuntu specifically. You're correct. And um, one of the more recent versions, even more specifically. But yes. Yes. Um, but, but in this notion of like, sort of like this app where I can pull up something, uh, configure my environment, my hardware with some moving some things around through some menus, um, and, and actually do some basic sort of path planning and setting up a part and visualization and maybe even run hardware. I, I think in, in the next year or so, we might have some sort of app deployable solutions that are basically really just ROS on industrial hardware. And that's really exciting. I think it can really open up uh, 
a different, like a new capability to a whole different set of users. Uh, and, and obviously on the training side, we're really excited to see universities offering more training to um, manufacturing engineering type people, mechanical engineers to get exposed to ROS uh, technicians. So this notion mm-hmm. of like, if I put a bunch of robots out there that are running ROS, what is the technician who has to fix the robot do with the ROS based system? Um, that, that piece of the education pipeline is still lacking. There's a couple mm-hmm. of programs. Wichita State, for instance, has been looking at a program for developing technicians for ros based systems. We're really excited to see, see how that evolves and being very supportive of those educational initiatives. So that's, that's awesome. awesome. Like that just makes the tank bigger, right? And that's, mm-hmm. that's really right now. <laughs> oh, yeah. And then um, do you have any links or contact info that you'd like to share with our listeners and watchers? Mm-hmm. Yeah, obviously Twitter at Ross Industrial. Um, we have a LinkedIn page, uh, both myself personally, it's Matt Robinson, uh, Ross Industrial, and the LinkedIn page is Ross Industrial. Feel free to to follow us there. We obviously have a, a specific discourse category as well, Ross Industrial. Um, we try to try to try to have some discourse about Ross Industrial there. Uh, mm-hmm. bear, bear with the bad pun. Uh, so, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I, I am engaged on the in my my team uh, and, and and our colleagues in Europe and Asia as well. Um, so we, we're actively looking forward to, to hearing what people's pain points are. What can we be doing better? Uh, awesome. How do we how do we how do we increase the acceptance and participation? So that's the other piece, right? How do we get this industrial community to also be actively engaging and participating, contributing to open source? That's probably the one side of our. Our, our, our cube, our Rubik that, that we're still still working on. But um, I, I think we're getting there. We're getting closer. And if people want to join your working group, um, any idea how to... Or, yeah, how to, so voice voice your interest over in the discourse category. I think it's the working group proposals under Ross Discourse Next Generation. It's called mm-hmm. Working Group Proposal Hardware Interfaces. Uh, so voice, or just ping me directly via one of the channels I know. Awesome. And actually, um, you guys maybe will be making a pull request to the ROS2 documentation um, and adding your working group info there, I assume. Um, you can yes. let me know if you need any pointers on that. <laughs> I'll, I'll yeah. probably have to delegate that, right? So, Perfect. But um, but I, I'm sure we'll figure it out once we figure out what the next steps are. Right. So um, Awesome. Other than hearing that it's a go, I haven't gotten any. <laughs> yeah, I guess most, it is super early. Kind of the, the next step is the most concrete next step I've heard so far. So, uh, <laughs> I appreciate that. Like right, I said, this has been as educational for me as it is for probably the listeners. Awesome. Well, thank you, Matt. Bye, everyone. <laughs> Bye. Thanks for listening to this conversation with Matt Robinson. Thank you again to our founding sponsor, Open Robotics. See you next time.